are back. Welcome back to Security Weekly, episode 400, doing this in support of EFF. You can go to wiki.securityweekly.com and go to episode 400, click on the link to donate to EFF and see our schedule for today. This next interview is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to learn more. Our interview for this segment is none other then Billy Rios, and Billy, I apologize about the title, but I called this segment Secure and Internet of Things in the same title. I know that kind of sucks. I apologize. Everybody drink. Everybody drink. <laughs> Welcome back to Cyber. the show, Billy. Oh, I can't hear Billy. Hey, guys. Thanks oh, for having there he me. Is. Appreciate hey, it. Hey, what's going on, brother? Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming back. Um, it's great to have you here. I hear that uh, you've been doing some teaching for SANS, so we get to hang out at the SANS ICS Summit, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I wanted to ask you about my favorite topic to talk about on the show. Well, close to my favorite topic. Uh, drinks and cigars <laughs> and that kind of stuff is pretty fun to talk about, too, as well as security in general. But I really like to focus on embedded device security. And Billy, you're... Uh, well known for doing research in this area. And it seems to me, after doing this for nine years with my fellow cohorts, that embedded device vulnerabilities seems to be getting worse, not better. <laughs> is that, is that, yeah, I, do you I, agree with that? I think we, uh, we have a long ways to go uh, with embedded devices, that's for sure. So, I, I mean, we should not be able to run strings on a, a firmware file or bin file and find hard-coded usernames and hard-coded certificates inside that file, right? I, I would hope that we have moved past those types of vulnerabilities. Uh, I know the rest of the, the IT world has definitely moved past those types of things. Uh, hard-coded backdoor usernames and passwords. Um, you know, I think a lot of more mature software manufacturers, uh, we don't do those types of things anymore, right? And so you could say that from a security standpoint, uh, we are take, taking a step back, maybe 10 steps back. Uh, but you know, I think it's important to understand that a lot of these devices do really cool things, right? So, uh, and some of them are going to change the way that we live our lives. Mm. And so, um, there's kind of a challenge I think that a lot of folks are kind of encountering, where they want to balance the innovation, uh, they want to balance, you know, the, the speed to market uh, against security. And I think right now, security is kind of losing that battle. So, uh, hopefully, we can inject ourselves into that process and get some sanity from a security standpoint on, on some of these devices. Is it better in some areas? I know. When you were at Silence, you did a lot of research into medical devices. Um, recently, you started looking at um, screening devices, airport screening devices. I, are there certain industries where things have gotten better? Eesh. Um, no. Uh, looking at the yeah, looking at the medical looking at the medical industry, uh, they have a really long ways to go, and they have a lot of challenges, right? I, I mean, I'll tell you a, a real challenge that some folks are facing. Uh, you know, let's say you want a device in the operating room, um, and you can't put a complex password on that thing, right? If a, if a surgeon has to get something out of a, a drawer or has to turn on a device uh, in an emergency situation, uh, they may have rubber gloves on their hand, right? They may not have the extra 20 seconds it needs to type in uh, a password to a screen someplace. Um, <clears throat> it's just not it's just not an alternative for them, right? So uh, they're in a in a pretty tricky situation. Same with implantables, right? If a, if there's a device. Uh, that's inside of somebody, uh, the update story becomes a really, really important story, right? Because you need to have a lot of quality in that update story and uh, how people can update those things or access those things and what it takes. And, you know, if, if someone in a critical situation, like in an emergency room, needs to get data, uh, the last thing they want to do is have to turn to their colleague and ask them if they remember the password for something, right? right. Do you remember the password for the defibrillator, or uh, or they fat finger it, you know, twenty times while they're while they're trying to get this thing energized? Yeah, and so, Jack was telling yeah. me he likes to update his hearing aid rectally. I'm not sure. If that's, <laughs> I don't know how that makes sense, but that's, don't I, say I, that I think when that's I've got the safest way hand. because when you, when you try to update something in that way, uh, you're definitely going to understand every step of the process, yeah. and you're going to understand I mean, where that, your exposures are, I mean, right? That, for that, those for those wondering, for those wondering. Wondering, uh, I've made it until eleven fourteen to issue my first f bomb. Fuck you, Paul. <laughs> there it is. You know what? It, it took longer than we thought. Yeah, really. yeah. I, yeah. Get on my I get that a lot. It was nothing age related. Yeah. It was mainly related. Interesting. Uh, Talk about a back door. Anyway. Yeah, oh. exactly. <laughs> and that's hard coded, man. You can't get rid of that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Billy, have you met with? Uh, manufacturers of these devices and ask them why or have any 
inclination as to why their security model is from the 1980s or 90s? Yeah, maybe? I, yeah, I definitely have. I'll, I mean, I'll tell you a story about the backdoor passwords and why they're there. So. Um, and this is something important to understand, even in IoT, right? Not just medical or critical infrastructure, but uh, you know, when you're let, let's take a really easy example. Let's say you're a bank uh, and you want to install some really cool HVAC environmental controls for your corporate headquarters, so everyone can be very comfortable. Uh, you are not going to tell your bank teller, your employee, to install that for you. Uh, you're going to hire someone to install that for you, and that that organization that you hire is what we refer to as an integrator. Uh, and so it's basically a third party that's going to install these devices and systems into your infrastructure. Um, and so they're also going to be the people that you call when something goes wrong. So if that thing breaks, if your HVAC system breaks for your corporate headquarters, uh, you're likely going to call someone to come fix that. Uh, and those people that come to fix those devices, uh, they need access to those devices. And so instead of trying to find the right person or trying to find the password log or trying to maintain uh, you know, some type of really cool authentication to get access to these devices, the easiest way for them to regain access to the device to do administration or maintenance is to just hard code or username and password into these devices, and so uh, that's why we that's why we see that you know these types of issues are more prevalent when it comes to the IoT and embedded. And I'm telling you right now, uh, this is going to happen in the commercial space too. You know, when you want to buy the really cool home automation system for your house that does a lot of really cool things, it's likely you're going to hire someone to come install that for you, unless you're really good at cutting out sheetrock and and wiring things up. So. But I think most of the people are not comfortable doing that, so they're going to hire someone to install these systems. And hopefully, uh, we don't see the same security practices where the integrator just says, "Hey, look, we want to make this simple. We want our technicians to be able to log into these things quickly to do administration and maintenance. So we're just going to hard code our usernames and passwords into the devices." No, that I I had never thought of it that way. That's that's an excellent example. Um, what about the other some uh, security problems that we see, such as vulnerable code, buffer overflows? Um, you know, clear text protocols, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily need to be there for maintenance, right? But in my experience, embedded systems have these vulnerabilities as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, some things are just the nature of the beast and we have to find new, I think, creative ways to address uh, things like credentials, right? Um, 15, 20 character passwords inside the operating room where someone may have a glove on their hand or may not be able to get to a keyboard. Uh, that's something that we have to overcome that's very specific to specific situations. But you're absolutely right. You know, uh, buffer overflows, you know, inside of a web server, embedded web server, that's not acceptable. There's, there's no reason to have that. Uh, clear text protocols, you know, we know how to do this already. We've solved these problems yeah. uh, in other places in the industry already. Uh, we shouldn't have to resolve these problems again in the embedded world. So knowing the, the differences when we're dealing with a really specific situation uh, that's harder to fix because of certain circumstances, and knowing when we're not dealing with those types of situations and just fixing bugs uh, that the IT world has fixed 20 years ago, that's an important distinction to be able to make. And um, I think that's probably the first place that we should start. Those are easy fixes, easy wins. It, you know, you brought up an interesting point, Billy, that I wanted to ask you about in terms of the embedded web server that's on these devices. It seems to me that that's usually contains some vulnerability in some way, shape, or form. Either it's in the web application itself or it's in the actual web server code itself. And in the IT world, we solved this problem with web frameworks, right? Like .NET actually has a really good security model. But when you go to the embedded systems, the web, you know, .NET doesn't run on these embedded devices. Neither does, you know, any other kind of framework like, God forbid, PHP. I don't think that would solve much. But um, so is there, a, do you know of anyone or have recommendations for what like web framework embedded systems can be using that fits on these small special purpose devices? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, that, that's an important question. I, I think um, more importantly, we're never going to get it right in one shot, right? So yeah. even if we pick the best you know, web framework available at the time, uh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good position to be in, definitely. But that thing is not going to last 20 years in the security space, right? There's going to be bugs. There's going to be issues. And so more importantly, I think folks should ask themselves, hey, when we encounter a problem, how are we going to be able to fix this? And so uh, if the web framework that we rely upon has some issue that we discovered, you know, heart bleed or whatever else you want to call, whatever bug, right? Like, um, how do we fix that? How do we update these things in a safe way, uh, in a way that's not going to take down the device or cause an interruption to whatever it's supporting? And so a uh, really good question. Uh, a lot of folks I see, they just roll their own, right? They just yeah, create their own web too. server. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why someone would do that. Uh, but even if they did, 
uh, they have to understand how they're going to update that thing because most of the code that we see, once it's put on the device, it's there. Uh, it doesn't get touched. It doesn't get changed. Uh, it's very much a cultural issue, I think, with embedded engineers where it's working, don't mess with it, you know, it's not broken, yeah, just let it run. Uh, we, we can't have that mentality, right? We're not going to get it right in one shot. It's, it's impossible to do that in security. And so understanding how we're going to fix this thing once an issue is discovered is probably more important than uh, trying to decide which framework we're going to use from the start. Yeah, so Billy, what can we do to, I mean, we could talk about the problem at length, right? But what can we do to raise awareness, especially Let's start with raising awareness amongst manufacturers of these devices. What can we do to raise awareness and, and arm them with the processes and tools they need to make a secure system? I guess first we have to convince them that they need to make something that's secure and add security in their process, right? right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, th that's pretty challenging, right? I, I, the, the problem is, uh, I think, when we look at the embedded space, uh, some of the problems that we encounter are that you know, we are dealing with engineers, right? And so we're all, we all have engineering mindsets. We all have like curiosity. And, you know, I'm pretty sure if we wanted to, we could probably all sit down and take a couple weeks and create some really cool embedded devices or, you know, whatever you want to call IoT or whatever. So um, these people are usually pretty technical. Uh, and they, a lot of times they've been doing this for a really long time. And so uh, breaking into that culture may be a little different than some of the other cultures. So, uh, but I think it's, it's, you bring up a good point. I think it's important to focus on, you know, how these things are different, not only from a vulnerability standpoint, but there are things we can do in the embedded world that we can't do in the regular IT world, right? So for example, uh, we can understand every single process that's going to be launched on certain embedded devices, every single one, right? It's, a, it's definitely a finite state. Um, these are not, you know, consumer PCs that people are using where they're allowed to install anything that they want. Uh, an infusion pump is designed to run a certain set of processes, has a certain set of files on there. Uh, those files came from the manufacturer. Uh, nothing else is supposed to be installed or running on that pump, right? And so we can use that to our advantage. We can't do that for a Dell laptop. We can't do that for a MacBook. Uh, we have no idea what a user is going to install or what they're going to do or how they're going to change configuration for that. But for a lot of embedded devices, we don't have to worry about that sort of stuff. And so that's actually an advantage. We can use that to build some pretty innovative security solutions, I think. Hey, I have a related question for you, and it's one that I, I flip back and forth on, which is Microsoft has been making this big push for using, brace yourself, Windows for IoT. Windows XP embedded. No, not XP, but using oh. a modern. And my first reaction is that goes completely against the logic of what Billy was talking about, you know, go back a few years and the, the answer was use QNX. And it's like, no, we're going to run yeah. NT. It's like, no, use QNX, we're going to run NT. But the flip side of it, and where Microsoft has a point, is that in some classes of things, manageability is critical. And the management infrastructure around Windows devices um, is significant. And I see an argument there. I'm not sure I buy it, but considering how rarely special purpose devices, PLCs, and things like that are, are at updated, even where we have the opportunity to, to push out secure code, um, I, I wonder if there's a trade off there. Uh, and it, you know, the answer, I'm sure, is nuanced. But what are your thoughts on that, Billy? Where does management fit in, and is where does the the added complexity of ease of management offset or does it offset the simplicity? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I think we kind of dug this uh, grave by ourselves, right? So if we look at a lot of IoT devices and PLCs and building automation systems, there is no management. There's none, zero, right? So uh, if you want to see all the users on your facility automation systems, you have to log into all the facility automation systems and, and get a user list, right? And so that's horrible. And um, because we've kind of put ourselves in that situation, uh, people are going to present themselves with saying, hey, we have this management capability, right? And so whether Microsoft's the right place to do this, I'm not sure. And, uh, and um, to be honest, I don't think security engineers are going to uh, drive that to market, right? It's really going to be folks that are uh, investing really heavily in creating some of these devices or creating uh, you know, these cool offerings. So, but uh, with that said, there has to be a way to manage these things, right? So when um, when you're a corporation and you're buying the cool little conference room schedulers that go on the wall of every conference room to tell you whether it's occupied or not, uh, and do you know where that do you know where that data comes from? It's coming from your Exchange server, right? Uh, and if it's coming from your Exchange server, it's got domain creds on it, right? And so um, and if that thing is just sitting there by itself and not managed in any way, you have a clear tech set of 
domain credentials sitting like on some random device in your network, right? And so, and that's something we've definitely seen before. Uh, when we when we talk about situations like that and show people situations like that, uh, makes them nervous, right? And so they they want to have a way to manage that. And if we can bring a good management solution to manage IoT devices, I think it would go a long way. Uh, hopefully, we don't get tied into one specific vendor or anything like that. Uh, hopefully, it's it's a little more open, but uh, it's definitely something that people need for sure. And we'll see, you know, who steps up to try to address that. Well, it's interesting. One of the gaps that I see in the uh, IoT or embedded space is the update process. For most, majority of devices that I see, the update process sucks. And what you said before, Jack, about Microsoft making an embedded operating system, to me, Microsoft's update process doesn't suck as much as it doesn't embed. I mean, it they doesn't, but embedded they, systems they are, they are typically getting They updated. are, the, the, right. as, as much as they've had issues yeah. uh, with updates lately, they are the world's largest software distributor. Yeah. Their update system with their distribution partners is great. They did have uh, the, the issue with Flame, which has been resolved. And that's, right. I mean, I that's the a, terror. There's a cream for that that you probably are. <laughs> The, the, I mean, the, the, the terror scenario. An anal comment, and he yeah. might get an f bomb. Uh, that's right. F bomb um, number two. Uh, no, no. It, it takes me longer to recover and be able to do that again. Uh, so, <laughs> and, the, and you can tell Jack's been drinking Bloody Marys. Yeah, it's uh, the it's yeah. Anyway, hey, so Billy. So back um, to back to yeah, Billy. Back to we, Billy. We, yeah, let's, he, I he, wanted he to ask you this. about the update <laughs> process for firm, firmware. You seem to have uh, kind of alluded to that the update process is very important. Um, are there good examples of vendors doing it right? And then what are some horrific examples about like firmware not even being able to be updated? Yeah, I think most of the examples are pretty bad. Um, I know one specific example um, for a medical device, a really cool medical device, but I, I can't uh, say exactly who it was. But um, most of the most of the time, what we're asking folks, you know, when we think of IoT and embedded and all this other stuff, critical infrastructure, you know, things like supply chain level attacks start to come into play. And you know, I've talked to some folks, and I said. How are you going to do analysis against supply chain attacks when we can't even tell whether or not you have a really known good firmware, right? Um, I don't think I've ever seen signed firmware. I, actually, I take that back. There's there's one device made by Rockwell that I know of that has signed firmware. Yeah, there's uh, but a couple of devices. Other than that, that I haven't seen. Firmware. Yeah, I haven't seen anything yeah, in the real it's world not that has signed, right? right? Yeah. So we have a long ways to go. I mean, if we cannot simply down download or get signed firmware that has some assurance from a vendor or a way to check it before we install it on a device, uh, we have a lot of problems, right? A lot of the firmware update facilities are made to are made available to unauthenticated users. That's pretty common in the embedded world for some reason, right? So um, most of the checking that's done on embedded devices are just simple checksums to make sure that, uh, you know, that the firmware is going to work on the, on the, on the chip that it's going to be uh, installed into. So uh, we definitely have a long ways to go for that. But here's where I think we can get some really easy wins, right? Um, just signing that thing so people can verify that it actually came from the manufacturer or the vendor as opposed to just rolling the dice and hoping that it came from them. Uh, maintaining repositories of you know, known good. Uh, you know, there's only a finite number of firmwares out there. Uh, it's not like it's you know, a, huge, uh, a huge number that's unmanageable. We can definitely track every, every piece of firmware that someone has created uh, and get people information so they can verify that before they install it on their devices because once it's on the device, it's really hard to verify. Uh, in fact, I don't know if there's a way that we can scale verification of firmware on devices, right? So uh, let's not put ourselves in that situation. Let's not dig that grave for ourselves. Uh, let's get ahead of that problem and solve it, because I think we can get some easy wins there. Josh, did you, could you, yeah, you I, want to say something? I, I do. I actually have a question. Now um, I can see you because you're here with me. It's wonderful. I know. Yeah, isn't it? It's I so can, good to see you. I can smell Give him a too. hug. Like, oh, we'll, we'll hug later. Yeah. We'll hug later. Ask your question. My, my question was this, uh, Billy. Uh, <laughs> earlier on, you, you had alluded to challenges in the embedded system space, and you know, especially medically with, with uh, authentication and authorization and, you know, sort of this password problem, which we're, we're all, all dealing with actually throughout the industry. But my question is this, are you seeing biometrics make an entry into the authentication space in the imbi embedded systems and, and, and how do you feel about that if you are? You mentioned that with the rubber gloves. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I haven't seen any biometrics, but you know what I have seen is proximity. 
And so um, I know in the medical space, there's a lot of healthcare organizations that are considering proximity. So if a doctor is close, you know, via a radio frequency or something like that, if they're close to a device, the device will consider them authenticated. And uh, I think that's a good example of someone saying, hey, look, this is our situation. Um, you know, the traditional you know, type of password in, isn't, isn't going to work? What else can we do? And are there risks with that? Of course there are. But uh, I think for, you know, specific circumstances or specific situations, it's probably a good, it's probably a good solution. Right, so uh, and, and rolling that out and maintaining it and managing it, it it's, it's a little more straightforward, I think, when you have a good, a good solution like that. So I haven't seen too much as far as biometrics go, but I have seen uh, proximity. I've seen that at some organizations as well. Uh, in the IT world, I thought that was pretty effective. You know, I worked at an organization where uh, in order to check, check in code to production, you know, which is a pretty important thing, uh, you had to basically be sitting at a computer, right? Because it would uh, basically uh, check proximity via a device that people, have, developers, had to carry around. So, uh, can offer a lot of benefits. Uh, we'll see. We'll see uh, how far it goes if it ever gets into the biometric space. That'd be pretty interesting as well. Uh, and in some cases, it's not going to work, right? If you're in a if you're in an operating room and you have goggles on and you know and, and gloves on uh, and a mask on, right? Um, biometrics may fall down in those types of situations. But sure. um, yeah. in other cases, it may work. Yeah. Yeah, that, I so, think your proximity uh, comments, uh, that, that's a good one, uh, and I think that's a reasonably good solution. Hopefully it's well implemented in the cases right. that you've seen. But. Yep, that, yeah. and now that said proximity stuff, do you start putting RF in an operating room and... Is that bad? It, exactly, yeah. exactly. Does your exactly. RFID, yep. RFID tag still work? Yes. That's, that's pretty amazing. We should have played that video during the break. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Drive everyone away for the afternoon, yeah, right? Huh? Um, so Billy, what... What's the real threat? I, I'm reading these articles that are briefing CIOs about what they really are concerned about or what they should be concerned about in terms of this Internet of Things threat. And one of, some of the articles I've read, they highlight uh, these things such as Bluetooth devices in the boardrooms and fitness bands as <laughs> something that CISOs should be worried about as a threat to their organization. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, you're laughing, I, so I kind of yeah, I, I, I am laughing, right? So, um, you know, this this is definitely a danger, right? Like, uh, you know, we don't we definitely don't want to overstate what the risk is, right? We want to help people understand what the risk is, and you know, I think today, if I had to go talk to someone, you know, and then talk about this specific issue, I would talk to them basically about how IoT and embedded devices in their corporate network offer pivot points. Yeah. You know, so right, and that's something that I think a lot of people understand. It's pretty easy for them to conceptualize when you show them a text file that has domain creds inside of the conference room scheduler that's on in front of their conference yeah. room that's yep. network yep. enabled, right? Done so, that. Done that. Uh, yep. and we've also showed people that hey, look, you know, sometimes the integrator that you know wanted to do remote access and management, they'll hook up these devices to like a DSL modem or a cable modem. Uh, so they'll know where it's at and they can manage that thing a little better and uh, that's a great exfiltration point, right? So all that money you've spent on endpoint protection and uh, proxies and, and, and network inspection, uh, egress filtering, that goes out the window, right? Because uh, I'll just exfil everything out of this DSL modem that's hooked up to an ISP uh, that's not hooked up to your infrastructure, right? Pretty neat. So I think people are more who are more progressive, what we're trying to help them understand is uh, if the device has any kind of physical movement, if it moves at any kind, there's a lot of danger there, safety dangers. Uh, the medical world, pretty much, you know, every device that we look at, class one devices, those could hurt people. You know, they, in, the, in the industry, they call that patient harm. Uh, the possibility for patient harm is very high. Uh, infusion pumps, you know, insulin pumps, I think as people have demonstrated, pacemakers, uh, those definitely have the capability to hurt people. Uh, on manufacturing now floors. Wait, can you yeah. but can you assassinate someone like the vice president using a pacemaker <laughs> attack though? That's the question, Billy. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, and I, this is probably one part of your drinking game here. So uh, I think as we've seen in Sony, you know, like we've looked at the technical pieces. Uh, and it's probably very similar to what we've seen before. But I think what's what's really <coughs> neat is the, the motives, right? Not neat, but what's different. What's really different is the motives, right? And what they're willing to do. And uh, we see that, hey, look, there are people, we don't really understand their motives. And maybe their motives are to hurt a company, to harm a company. Right. to destroy a company, right? And so uh, that's one thing that I kind of see as different <clears throat> in the recent attacks that we've seen. Uh, and if, if people want to take that kind of mentality to places like healthcare, to manufacturing, to critical infrastructure, um, that's not a good position for us to be in as defenders, right? And so that's something that we definitely need to think about. Right now, I think most of the threats that we're dealing with here now today on people's networks uh, has really more to do about uh, escalation and, and IP theft and that sort of thing. But 
you know, I, I'm, I'm sure over the next couple of years, we're going to see more attacks like what we just saw over the last couple of weeks where the motivation is to really hurt a company, to punish a company for some reason or another. Um, and that brings in, I think, a whole new realm of attacks and a whole new realm of possibilities. And that's an interesting point, Billy. We haven't really seen the catastrophic attacks happen in terms of embedded devices and Internet of Things where they've been attacked and caused harm, right? Like the whole power plant in Brazil was not a, a hack or something like that. Um, is that because there are other safeguards in place or like what's the reason for that? Um, well, this is what I tell folks, uh, mainly in the medical world. Uh, this is advice that I give them. Uh, the advice is let's not rely on the will, goodwill of strangers as our security policy or our security strategy, right? And so, um, you know, the reasons, the reasons that these things have not happened are not technical barriers. I can tell you that right now. They're not engineering barriers. Uh, I think the reason uh, that these things have not happened is because of the goodwill of strangers, <laughs> you know, and, um, and that, that's, not a, that's not a defensible position. That's not a good strategy. And so uh, we have to make it to where if someone does want to cause someone harm, if someone does want to destroy some process, uh, we have to make it hard for them from an engineering perspective uh, once someone decides to cross that line. And, and we're definitely not there yet. And I think we'll, you know, we'll see this over the next couple of years where uh, more and more of these things will come out and people will understand how to manipulate these processes in a much more uh, efficient way. And it's, it's, it's going to cause some organizations harm, right? And I know that um, publicly, if you go to DHS's website, you know, things like facility automation systems, they've been attacked already. You know, I know that someone has gained access to, to a manufacturing company on the East Coast. Uh, there's another uh, there's another threat actor who gained access to a state uh, a state agency on the East Coast as well. Um, you know, I've been on manufacturing plants where I've seen uh, people on networks that probably shouldn't have been there. So uh, it's definitely happened. Why someone hasn't taken it to the next level to cause someone harm or destroy a process? Uh, it's definitely not engineering barriers. Uh, it's really more about you know they they don't feel like they should have to do that or maybe their motives aren't aren't there and. Like I said, relying on the goodwill of a stranger as our security strategy, that's not, that's not a good strategy. Mm. No, I, I agree. Um, do you think for manufacturers of embedded systems, is it, is it, they need better software, better software processes? Like, can we a attack this problem by getting them to build better software? Or does the problem just go way deeper than that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that we can do um, from a manufacturing side that's that's pretty poor. I'll, I'll give you an example of something that um, that we're talking about in the medical device world, right? So, uh, right now, most manufacturers they can't tell you um, what every single file on the device should be. They can't tell you what open ports are are accessible and why those those ports and services are available, right? And so, uh, these are really simple things. Right? Uh, they should be able to tell an organization, hey, uh, you just bought our infusion pump. These are the three ports you need to have open in order for this thing to run. Right? Th that we can't do that right now. And so, uh, and that's, that's something that's easy for a manufacturer to do. That's very hard for an end user to do. Right? And so um, I think we should identify those places where this is really a manufacturing responsibility because it's easy for you to get this information as opposed to letting an end user do that. That's where I think a manufacturer responsibility should lie. And um, I got kind of a question, kind hey, of a follow on to Paul's Strand. question. Hey, John, how's it going, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> doing better. Um, so, you know, we always hear about secure software, secure software. People got to write, st start writing secure software. Even if you could wave a magical wand today and all the software from here on out was being secured. In this particular area, that's not really a, a, a solution because a lot of the software is old already. It's ancient. And it's, you know, it's going to be continuing on for a long time because of the mentality of a, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. At least that's what a lot of managers say. So how do you counter that when you're talking with your customers? Where you say this is old, out of date, dangerous, and they basically say, "Well, it's working." Yeah, that's. A, I mean, this is a problem that I think every embedded manufacturer faces. And uh, you know, what I always tell them is, "Hey, you know, this is the elephant, right? And we're trying to eat the elephant. Let's take it one bite at a time." And so, I think what we should do is, it's, is just separate those into two different problems, right? There's a legacy problem of devices that are already installed, that are already horribly insecure, they're in manufacturing plants, they're in critical infrastructure, um, it's hard to go in and change those things. Uh, but there's new devices that are coming out all the time, right? And so let's not put those in the same category. We can definitely improve uh, the security and, and, the, and the posture and the resiliency of new devices coming out. We shouldn't let the old legacy problem affect new devices. And so uh, let's put the new devices in its own category. Let's start working on solutions for the new stuff 
and then the old stuff, the legacy stuff, that, that requires a different approach. You're absolutely right. You know, we can't just tell manufacturers to make sweeping changes to old legacy code because it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's probably not going to be effective because no one's going to install those changes because, like you said, the process is working. Let's not mess with it. But more importantly, there's probably no business incentive for them to do that as well, right? So uh, two different problems. And I, and I hope that when we start to tackle these problems, we recognize that those are two different problems. And, uh, you know, they're not, they're not tied to each other in many ways. New devices, we can have much higher standards for. Old devices, we probably need to take a, a different view. And I think for the older devices, this is where a lot of responsibility gets pushed onto the end user, right? So if you own an, an, an old legacy embedded system of some kind, uh, it's pro it's going to be your responsibility to try to protect that thing and safeguard that thing as an end user. Um, you know, you're not going to. I don't think there's a lot that the manufacturer can do. You know, that bullet has left the chamber, uh, and it's in your organization, right? So now it's it's really up to you to kind of uh, develop the mitigation plan and, and security plan around that old device. Uh, do we need to start from the ground up, or are there add-on solutions, Billy, that we can use to apply security to the uh, embedded world? Yeah, that, you know, that's a really good question, and um, to be honest, I think for any person in the security space, this is a great area to show some real entrepreneurship, right? To, some, to show some real innovation, because um, you know, in the IT space, I think we're starting to mature there. In the embedded space, we're definitely not. And so, um, if you're working on embedded products and you find yourself going through a process over and over again to verify firmware, to do forensics, to do network analysis, to do baselining, to do whatever, uh, that's a really good opportunity for you. Because I'm telling you, a lot of people need these solutions. Uh, there aren't very many solutions for the embedded space when it comes to security. And so. Um, um, you know, some people view that as a bad thing, but I view that as a good thing, right? A lot of smart minds can put uh, put some brain cells onto this problem and, and figure out how to solve some of this stuff. Uh, you know, is it as mature as I'd like it to be? Definitely not, but there's definitely a lot of opportunity for people trying to enter this space as far and as creating solutions and helping people. Will that hint to your next venture, perhaps? That you, want to say public, that you want to say publicly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a startup. Um, we're focused on embedded stuff, like primarily facility automation, building automation stuff. Um, you know, we do as assessments and, and that sort of thing against embedded devices. Um, we're also looking at industrial control systems. I mean, I, I'll tell you an example, right? Like, so um, you know, I, I have a firm. It's called Laconically, but uh, we create. We're trying to create, you know, a list of known good hashes for industrial control system files. Right, and uh, and this this whole thing wasn't created just because I sat down one day and said, "Hey, look, we really need this." This happened one day because I was on an HMI system. We suspected that it was compromised, and every file on there looked like it was malware. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's all like poorly named. None of it's signed. Some of it's communicating to the internet. Some of it's bind, bound to weird ports. And uh, we're like, "What is this?" You know, I wish there was a quick way for me to go through a thousand files, and I can't go through them by hand. Uh, and, you know, and, and there's no there's no signing, there's no known good hashes from the manufacturer. So um, that was uh, that was something I thought we could probably just solve this, right? We probably just start creating a huge database of this. Right. Uh, and if someone else ever encounters a problem like this, they can probably just do a quick lookup to see whether or not they're looking at has been seen before in installation media. Uh, these are these are things I think a lot of folks can you know bring to a market, bring solutions like this uh, that are very helpful to other people doing embedded assessments. Billy, now I have very important five questions for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. <laughs> In a suit. Because <laughs> I were, have a meeting after this. <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Mm, probably a sharpened knife. There's something about knife fighting that's uh, appealing to me. <laughs> wow. Thanks. Good, answer. You wrote, good answer. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, my days as a Madagascanese olive smuggler. And uh, that's definitely a barroom discussion. Maybe the next time we catch up at uh, Casa Fuente, we'll talk about olive I'm smuggling. I'm going to hold you to that, Bill. I'm going to hold you to that one. <laughs> Damn. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first? Or second, <laughs> I think first mover advantage has uh, has definite definite advantages in the market, so I prefer to go first. That's the marine. <laughs> most Marines will answer that question <laughs> first. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why if it's your reason or something else, but um, pick two celebrities to be your parents. <laughs> Let's see, uh, John Stamos. People tell me uh, that uh, I have some kind of uncanny representation, uh, like uh, I look a lot like John Stamos. So, and, and maybe like Angelina Jolie. 
Mm. Wow. So and common an answer. answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, she all is the, a popular all, choice. I'm, I'm sorry. All the guys on this podcast have mommy issues. Yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> they all pick hot moms, myself included. Well, she was in Hackers, too. I don't know if that has still, any yeah, still I, I was getting ready to vehemently deny, but I, I just can't. <laughs> come on. Come on, come on. I, I, I picked Jessica Alba. I mean. Yeah, well, that's a That's a good one. one. Yeah, yeah, that is a fun, fun choice. The Dark like, Angel? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Billy, yes. thank you very much for appearing on Security <laughs> Weekly. It was great to have you here. I wish you the best of luck in your new venture, and I can't wait to hang out with you more uh, Sands ICS Summit. Will it, you'll be on a panel out there, is that correct? Yep, I'm going to be on a panel out there. So I'll be there at least for one day, okay. at least. I don't have the date. You know, we're going to have to talk about that next year uh, okay. on our first show and announce the dates, because I'll be teaching. Billy will be on a panel. It's in February. It's in Orlando. How can right. you not attend that? Exactly, so. exactly. Billy, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Take care. With that, we're going to take a short break. And during our short break, you're going to see a 34-minute video clip of our previous guest answers to the five questions, because we think it's fun. Then we're going to air the original Mike Poor and Ed Scotus interview, the first time they were ever on the show 396 episodes ago. During the break, we will pick a winner for our t-shirt contest. And we will, we will. award yeah. the winner with a free Hack Naked t-shirt very similar to the one that I am wearing right now. Woo! Not the one I'm wearing right Although if you want the one I'm wearing right now, I would literally give our listeners the shirt off my back. Trust me, you don't want it. Does <laughs> it smell <laughs> already? No, no, no. You remember, remember the post-exploitation towels? He Dude. ran out. Yes. Oh, boy. So with that, we'll take a short break uh, for lunch, and we're going to come back at 1 o'clock and interview Jeremy and Richard from the EFF. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back. 